Welcome to Saturday night in the uh, Real Love Guitars workshop down here in Devon in the gloriously dark and getting colder United Kingdom. And uh, here we have a Tanglewood Nevada. The Tanglewood are a good, not bad actually, good um, guitar making company. And this is a really budget style guitar and it's then their Strat version or their version of the Strat. And it's uh, Thomas's or it will be Thomas's guitar and he's a, a young fella who's just starting to get into playing and his uh, parents wanted something well he wanted an electric guitar and they wanted something that he could play that would play really well um, but also wasn't so precious that it uh, it couldn't be bashed about a bit as you can see it already has so um, so that's the aim of today's little adventure will be to take this and turn it into a reasonably actually more than reasonably a very good player now one of the things i'm going to do is put the camera up there and try and work out a reasonable camera position um one of the things about this is some people think these guitars cannot be made into good players well they can um they're, they're capable, very capable of playing well, being easy to play. And ease of playing comes down to the way that the strings are over the first fret. Um, they need to be nice and low. And it comes down to the quality or condition of the frets as to how low you can set them. Also on this guitar, I don't know if you can see, but the neck is misaligned. So we need to correct that. Now we might as well do that bit of it right here and now. Um, yikes, this is... This is very sticky. <laughs> this doesn't look like it wants to come out. Um, it's been possibly jammed in here. We'll sort of see if we can help the original thread back its way out. It doesn't... Is it going to do it? Yes, it will. So it may be a mismatched thread. So, uh, uh, yeah, an arm from somewhere else, possibly. <laughs> but it's okay. We'll make it work. So, in some ways... Uh, on a guitar like this, I often take them apart completely, but in a sense, this one, there isn't really, uh, there's no real need to take it apart completely. Now, what I mean by that is, where sometimes I will take a guitar like this and up, upgrade it um, with the new parts and extra bits and bobs. But in this case, we're trying to keep it to the minimum expense. Um, so it's going to get set up more than anything and and just you know we want it to play really well um, so that's okay so what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to screw in the tremolo claws um, just to lock this down basically I want this guitar or this tremolo to be locked flat against the body um, currently it isn't um, and I'm not quite sure why that is it could well be that these here are too far down. I think that may well be the case. I'm going to slack these off for a minute. Um, so the key key aspect in making a budget guitar play is, I would say, the focus of the effort, or if you have very little money, is put the effort into. Um, there you go. Put this powder coming out of the tremolo hole. So God knows what that was. Yeah. So the key the key thing is to concentrate on the neck first of all because the neck is the it's where the playability of the guitar is or isn't and it's in the playability of the guitar that will determine or the playability of the guitar will determine whether somebody will continue playing it or enjoy picking up and playing it um, if it's hard to play and if, if it fights the player then it will not be something they reach for now the thing about this neck at the moment is it needs to move the neck needs to move this way so i'm going to with the string still on to use as guides i'm going to slack off the neck screws three of them and then i'll just slack the fourth one off a tiny little bit and, and it wants to kind of jump all over the place but i'm going to aim at see if we can get it to push down on this, push down as far as we can get it, boing, get it pushed down in this direction, if 
I can. <laughs> Takes a bit of fiddling, holding it in place, if I can do it. Uh, it wants to, wants to come out. I'm just looking at this. It's, it's struggling, to, if it's, even if it's in quite tightly. Well, maybe it will work. Yeah. Okay. We have to do it left hand to begin with. Do up. So I'll just get it there first, and then I will try and give it a bit more pull as I tighten it up. And it's sort of difficult to put um, too much pressure on it. It's difficult to hold it and put a lot of pressure on it. Let's have a look. That's better. Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, you, you could do this without the strings on, but the problem with that is you don't get to see the alignment and it doesn't give you a good impression. So I will pull this in like so. Right just about doable how to push sometimes I do this push it against my shoulder and then tighten it up in the position you want it in like so okay that's good that's very good in fact it's gone almost the opposite way which is shows how much room there is for adjustment in a strat neck what you want is you want more room on the treble side if anything um, so that the little youngsters hands will have room and the springs won't fall off the edge because that's the worst part okay so the next thing i'm going to do um, there are some issues here with the jack socket which we'll take care of so to make this play as well as it can i'm going to look at replacing the nut obviously we're going to change the strings clean it up and set the bridge uh, in a way that it's going to be um, get a nice low action but to get a nice low action we're going to probably need to level the frets um, and we'll have a look and we'll find out pretty quickly if we need to when we make adjustments so what i tend to do is for the action i tend to set three different components the first one is to see how curved the neck is and in this case with these strings on we seem fairly light it's probably a little bit too curved um, so i'm going to tighten the truss rod <coughs> to pull some of the curve out of the neck and the truss rod is a metal bar that should with luck should counter the curvature of the neck caused by the load of the strings it's got a little bit hard to um, turn especially when there are strings in the way so if you need to turn it sometimes it's better to pull the strings out of the way I'm hoping I can do that without these old strings breaking because I, I still need to use them for the fret leveling part of the process so quite stiff and it's not oh it is responding on the base side more than anywhere um, so let's see I was going to say it looked like it wasn't responding but it's straightening out more on the base side than anywhere else okay now what I'm going to do so I'll get my string height gauge, which I've got down, and I'm going to lower the strings until they're at an angle or a height that you should play at, ideally, or that you'd want to play at if you wanted an easy to play action. And I set them, personally, I set them at the last fret, and I tend to like to set um, one and a half millimeters at the last fret on the low E, and then the same all the way across until we get to the high E, but a sort of gradient, because I like to end up at the high E at about 1.2. Now with a, an old guitar like this, you may not want to play along with that. So I'm just going to first of all do this visually so I can do it quickly. These uh, grub screws on this, on these saddles are a bit rusty, so if any of them doesn't turn at all, uh, then I will replace them if necessary. But I'm trying to keep everything original so we don't have any extra expense. Um, but 
they, they do need coming up thing out. They do need stripping out or polishing out, uh, soaking probably in something and cleaning. But so these are the saddles where you set the guitar's playing action. Okay. Now I'm going to put it into roughly into tune using a tuning fork. plays very easily at that point. I'm not going to worry about the tremolo for now. The aim is at the end to set the tremolo so that it floats downwards only, um, which means the guitar will stay in tune a lot longer. Now my plan on this guitar is to put a tusk nut on in, instead of the original. Um, and the reason for that is that a tusk nut will stay in tune much better. So I've got a, a new one here. Um, which I will probably fit. It's probably a 16 inch radius and this is a 12 inch nut, but that will be fine for these purposes. Um, yeah, if we, if we, if we get this, um, if we get the nut changed, this one is plastic and it will, even though it's cut to the roughly about the right height, um, we want the strings to stay in tune when the tremolo works a little bit. So that best answer to that is to have a, a, a tusk nut up here. Um, so we'll remove the original, but for now I'm just using it where it is. Okay, so down here, the, uh, the action's now a little bit too low for um, this, this guitar or for the frets, but I'll just tweak it to where I exactly where I want it now and we should with a bit of luck it should be close now whether or not it needs um, fret leveling is usually decided by whether or not the notes that you play are choked um, and whether they don't play so when, when you have a fretboard with high frets on it which almost all guitars do um, you will find that certain notes that you try to play up and down the neck um, when you're at a low action they won't play because or well, they'll choke because you've basically the high frets or low frets are getting in the way some some can be high some can be low um, and so if that's the case then to to allow it to have that low action and to play all the notes adequately we do need to level the frets Not bad. That's that's what you get when frets are in the way. That right. So we have uneven frets um, which need leveling out. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep these old strings on and I'm going to just pull them out of the way for a minute while I paint the frets with marker paint, marker paint and marker pen. And this is part of the fret leveling process. These are, this is an old guitar. Um, it's got a little bit of wear on the frets. They weren't very tall to begin with. They were typical sort of Chinese manufacturing. Um, some people I think make the mistake because Tanglewood was a, 
I think was probably a British registered distribution company. I think I think people made the mistake of saying made in Britain. I'm pretty confident these guitars weren't made in Britain. Um, they would be made in the Far East. But uh, and these these the construction of these is very very familiar Chinese um, Chinese quality. But these are on the par with the encore Chinese encore guitars, and you know essentially there's nothing wrong with them. They they all feature a sort of a fairly decent neck that you you can certainly play on and you can certainly learn on. There's nothing wrong with them from that perspective. Um, it's rosewood. Uh, it's not some modern synthetic replacement, which some of them are pretty horrible. Um, so it's a kind of nice rosewood. It's got plastic dot inlays. Um, and all told, it should play very well. Um, the weaknesses on these guitars, don't mind the fact that it's a little bit out of tune after that stretch. Weakness tends to be the pickups. Um, pickups and tuners. But these are wor working okay. Okay, so right now um, I've got the action where I want it. Uh, at that height where I want it, it doesn't play very well at the moment because of the uneven frets, um, which all guitars have. Oop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a fret leveling process, um, which is unusual or different from a lot of people's approaches in that I do it with the strings on, um, with the neck curved and it, it call, as they call it in relief so it's curved and uh, with strings loading it and doing it this way means that when we get to playability when I level the frets enough to make them playable then um, we can take the strings off clean everything up and when we put new strings back on the neck will bend back to its position that it was in when I leveled the frets and that means that it will go back to its original place and we'll just be able to all the frets will be level relative to each other so the first thing I'm doing is I'm mapping the curve of the neck with this device here and once I've done that I then take the curved bar you can't really see it's curved but it is and I put it down on the neck of the guitar and I run it backwards and forwards mainly under gravity um, and I let it sand the frets where it touches them and so what I can see pretty quickly if I now stop for a minute I can see where it's touching the frets and where it isn't and it tells me where the high frets are so we've got a little bit of cutting some cutting a little more a tiny bit none 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 some right on the edge none quite a bit quite a bit quite a bit none 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 a lot none a little bit little bit a little bit so what it's telling me is that um, it, this way it's cutting tells me that we've got a flat spot or a high spot here, a dip, and it comes back up to one fret that's high enough to break the surface, then it goes back down to a low one, and then we've got a little crop of three high ones relatively, and then four low ones, and then four high ones. So it's, it, you can see literally this tool is telling me about the waviness of this fingerboard, which you can never see with the, the eye. So what's the plan? Well, the, well, the plan of attack is to use that, that um, beam to work these frets until they all play. Now they all play, which is great, so I'll do a tiny bit more, but we can be confident that that's done, we've done enough leveling uh, in the E track, as I call it, where the E string sits. But I'll do a little bit more just, just to get a sense of how <coughs> how big the peaks and troughs are between these frets. Okay, so high one here, high one there. We're getting to, we're cutting now there. We've come to the bottom of that dip and we're just about touching that one. A low spot here. Um, so we're not far off. 
Now I don't have to go all the way down to the bottom till I cut all of the frets because I'm only looking for enough leveling to make the action I've chosen play and that's what's good about this method. So other, other leveling methods tend to cut down until you've reached, you've cut all of the frets and in a sense you can say they are all physically level with each other. We, we don't need to make them level with each other, uh, we just need to make them level enough to play at the action that we've set. So again I can see a really high one here compared to everything else. Some high ones here um, and then we'll do the same test again and see if it plays. Now you can see the dust building up and that tells you where the uneven bits are. So high, low, high again, low again, high again. That's good, they all play. Now, what I, I'm, I'm reluctant to uh, do any bending here on these frets because if I bend, uh, these really, really old strings are going to break. Um, but the idea is to level so we can bend. That's choking out there. That's sort of halfway between the B and the G track. So I'm going to now recalibrate the beam and I'm going to see what the curvature is like in what I call the G track where the G string sits. And once I've reset the beam to match that part of the neck, this side of the, or this part of the radius going this way, and I'm going to level the G track. And if if I um, if we're lucky, leveling the G track will take away any uh, of the chokes when you bend strings. And that's you know often when you're playing lead guitar, <coughs> you want to bend these E string, particularly the E string, this way up here at the top of the neck. So that's kind of quite conventional. So you have to be able to bend it across into the G track. Otherwise, if it chokes out as you bend it across, your your lead guitar can sound really terrible you know, bang, and it chokes off. <laughs> uh, not very good when you're soloing away. So getting it level like this is a good way of making sure you can bend all the way across into the G track. And that just means you can bend a really big note upwards. Again, the high patches are showing up as high all the way across as we've seen. So each time I check that the notes individually play. Okay, we've got high fret here on number two. That's good, that's all playing. Just gonna check the radius, uh, sorry, the relief again. So the curvature's okay. That's definitely, um, I'm just making sure it's not hitting anything like the pickups. Sometimes that makes that kind of noise. But that's definitely, it's either a, there's either a low spot on this fret uh, or it's, this is very high. So I need to go down to this end now and consciously work on that second fret. Now when I say consciously work on that, what I mean is, can I get down this end and scrunch that second fret because it's clearly high relative to everything around it. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of cheating a bit now. I'm focusing on that spot deliberately. Now normally I'm just doing it from the middle um, but when I see that there's a problem down there, low down there, I have to do it that way. Now we'll hear this note now playing. So we could do it a little bit more and it will be good. So that's the nice thing about this method is that you can see because I've got the strings on I can stop and play and hear when I freed up the note that was jammed up if you like. Okay, so that's quite a lot of leveling because that was significantly higher at that end. Tiny bit more on the top end with the bar. My fingers get very dirty doing this, but I'll clean it all up at the end and give it a, a nice refreshing polish up. 
Okay, so once I've leveled the frets, you'll, you, you'll be able to see that some of the frets are really heavily scraped and some of them aren't at all. So this one's choking out here on the G right at the top. So again, I'll go back here and this time I'll spend a bit of effort on the G track right at the top. So again, what I mean by that is I'll just put a little bit more pressure down on this area here on the G channel. Get these freed up. These strings feel terrible. Tiny bit more on the G right at the top. So really gonna make these. Now I do this, I do exactly the same with any guitar, whether it's a you know top price Gibson or whatever. And I want to make this cheap guitar playable in the same way I want a Gibson, top of the range Gibson to be playable. And a, a misconception I think that a lot of people put about, and it's understandable because you know, we like we sort of grow up thinking that more expensive things are better, but it's a misconception that they, in the case of guitars, that a more expensive guitar will, by definition, play better. A lot of Gibsons I've worked on have needed this much fret leveling work as well. Uh, you know, and that's it's kind of it can be quite surprising, and some people don't like to admit that. They find excuses or make excuses for big name companies like Gibson. But, you know, I think the, the truth of the, pr the thing is that frets, when you hammer them in or tap them in or press them in or whatever way they go in, um, there you go, same problem with that fret. That fret, first fret, is bad. Sorry. The second fret is high, I should say. Um, yeah, a lot of people, you know, want to believe, a lot of us want to believe that, you know, the more expensive, the, mo the more money you spend, the, the better something's going to be. Um, and with guitars, it doesn't always work out. Yes, you get better, often you get better made components and, you know, you'll get better sounding pickups a lot of the time when you spend more. Um, but it's, frets are, are, like I say, they're a sort of, primitive process when you tap them in you're bashing them in with a hammer and nobody no two people hit the same way and no one person no one person hits the same way twice even so it's not a precise science fretting um, so the frets don't go in precisely ever and as a result they can be you know they can be sticking out a little bit more than the next one along and sometimes uh, like you see on this neck or I hope I've shown you on this neck the neck isn't level at all it goes along in like a little up and down set of curves and that means you've got some frets that sit, sit up higher and you've got some that are lower and so on and you have to still even that out because there's no other way around it when you play the guitar, it'll have strings on, the neck will be under compression, and it will go back into that shape. The only way you can deal with it is to take this curve that, the, that I've made with this beam and to impose it onto that little up and downy, sort of humpy bumpy road that I was talking about. And so that's what I do. I'm concentrating on this end because I know that this note is bad as well. So this second fret has got some severe problem. I don't know quite why. Sometimes in fretting, they can get you can get some gunge stuck in the fret slot, and you may tap it in on top of that, and it sits up a little bit, um, not sitting down the way as low as it should. And see if we can. Anyway, I don't know how well you can see it, but there's some flat spots showing up where we've leveled it, and you see the light reflecting off it. And some I've got more or less than others. Some haven't got any at all, like down there, very little on that one, just on the low edge. 
So there's a variety of different amounts of flatteredness, and the aim of this is to stay clean. Perhaps any chance of focusing? Oh my lord, thank you. <laughs> I'm getting a bit fed up with the iPhone. So now I'm going to crown the frets, and that means I'm going to gently file off the sharp shoulders, the flattened edges, and I'm going to kind of wear it inwards towards the center, rounding it as I go. And then the idea is to stop before I remove the black pen. So I want to attempt to leave as thin a line of black marker pen on there as possible. Um, now when the frets are quite low, like on this guitar, because it's old, um, that can be quite a challenge because this file has a sort of fixed concave shape in there. So uh, if this is low and flat, this can't quite reach it when the, when the edges are touching the wood. But it looks like we'll get, we'll get there just about. So I'm going to go all the way up the fretboard like this, trying to reshape the frets. And then after that, it's a case of uh, sanding these out, the frets out, and polishing the fretboard, or polishing the frets, uh, into a nice, shiny, playing finish. And that I do with a series of sandpapers and micromesh pads, and it takes about half an hour or so of sanding and all these different grades of paper, and I mask off the fretboard first so that the, the wood isn't touched by the paper. And so once that's done, then the frets are ready to play uh, and we can go on and clean up the rest of the guitar and make any other alterations that we have to do. But as it stands right now, this, the tops of all these frets now are all level the way they should be to play well. See that one, hardly any levelling at all needed because that was a very low one, as was this one here. Number two was the worst one of the lot so far. Number 10 here, only a bit in the middle really. Number 11, quite a bit of flattening all the way along. So what I tend to do is I do the sh uh, sanding business off camera because um, it's just noisy and a bit mucky. Um, and then I come back on when that's done and uh, the kind of the next bit in this will be to get the nut slots just right. Um, I think you know bone is a good substance for for nuts, um, and if you, if the slots are right, which I'll make sure they are, then it will stay in tune very well. That's a slight problem you get with some of these guitars; they have non-standard nut widths or nut depths front to back. Um, and it means you can't replace with a tusk nut unless you hand craft one from a, a, a tusk blank, which is a big block of tusk, which is a, a lot of a lot of work to do. Um, okay, so that's all of them done. And what I can do now is just start to clean this off. Now I'm going to get some cleaning solutions stuff called um, Coleman's cooking fuel and funnily enough this is it's a cooking fuel for camp stoves but it's actually pretty much a substance called naphtha which is great for cleaning uh, guitars because it doesn't it's very um, harmless it doesn't do anything to guitar finishes so I'm now coming down the neck and scrubbing as I go just to get the, the pen but also the, the ancient grime off the fingerboard as well so it's a it's a it's a um, solvent that lifts the dirt and finger grease off too so makes it much nice and cleaner nicer and cleaner so so far this is now gone from um, the main, the main achievement so far is taking this from a very ordinary mass-produced inexpensive guitar to one 
that is rare in the sense that the frets are leveled now. And that means, unlike you know, 99% of all the others of these guitars out there, this one you'll be able to set the action, or we can set the action low. And in setting the action low, we can play it much more easily. And it's not just how much lighter it is to play at, at both ends. Um, when we when we set the first fret action right as well by cutting the nut slots properly, um, we stop notes playing down at the nut from going sharp. And that's a very common problem in cheap, or actually not just cheap, all guitars, is that because the first fret action is almost always too high, the nut's too high, the nut's too big, and the slots are badly cut. Because of that, um, when you play notes down here near the nut, because the string is too high over the first fret, you it goes sharp when you press it. So it plays a note, but it plays the wrong note, too sharp. It plays an, the note you want, but several cents sharp. Um, and that means open chords can sound horrible. You, you want open chords to sound... You want the open notes, the unfretted notes in the open chord to sound really nice, and you want them to sound in tune with the fretted uh, notes, naturally. But if you don't, if you have the first fret action too high, that won't happen, and you will get, you know, up to half of your strings will be out of tune with the other half, which will be in tune with each other. And that makes a nasty sound. Um, and very often people who struggle from that express it by saying they, they can't seem to get the guitar in tune and actually the, the guitar is in tune but what's happening is the uh, is the notes played near the nut are going sharp um, and that's the problem so taking care of that is a really important aspect of um, it's, it's important in getting the nut right. And so when you get the nut right, you you do a number of things. The first thing you do is you get rid of, you set the first fret action at the correct low action or a low level, and you cure the the risk of notes played near the nut playing sharp, which makes those open chords sound terrible. Um, that's one advantage. The other one is that the guitar feels generally much, much easier to play because it's lighter down here. And when the, when the guitar is light to play down here, you'll play chords that are technically difficult, like F. They will become light as a feather to play, and it'd be much easier to play those technically tricky chords. Um, so that's all thanks to lowering the action at the first fret. And then low action at the other end um, means you can reach, you can play notes higher up without exhausting your hand as well, your fingers. And this is a, fortunately this is quite a, these are quite old these string trees, so I'm not a great fan of them, but we'll have to use them for now. As I say, a tusk, a set of tusk string trees is about a tenner, or that's 12 quid I should say depending where you get them from. Unfortunately, everything is going up all the time. It's not just going up, it's been going up for the last year and a half or two years. It's horrendous. And everybody's just bumping their prices up. Okay, so while I'm at it, and while I've got the cloth out and the, the goo flowing, I'm going to do a kind of run around clean of everything else, um, just for now, because Everything's grimy, and it's nice to give it a bit of a clean-up. Um, it's never possible to clean everything up completely because things are rusting with age um, and so on, but we can get somewhere towards it, and um, we can also get rid of some of the scratchy plastic that builds up underneath the pots. So I'm just going to remove that with my scalpel. I hate that stuff. The scratch plates come with a 
extra layer of um, always come with a couple of layers of cellophane on them which is great but when you pull them off in your rush to get playing it bunches up underneath the, the screws and the uh, the pots or the knobs so it's a it's a bit annoying and often when that happens it sort of sits there and scrunches when you turn the pots you can hear it or feel it and it can be mighty annoying so I'm just going to go and hose down the other side with this same stuff to get as much of the grime out of the way and the tuners are whoops I've tightened the tuners up um, but they're actually performing pretty well so it, it, tuners are a popular misconception people when they have trouble with their guitar staying in, not staying in tune many people think that or many people get advised to buy better tuners um, and that really isn't the thing the, the guitar stays in tune thanks to uh, the nut being right and thanks to you stretching out the slack in your new strings each time you restring the guitar. It's those two things I would say are single-handedly, two things can be single-handedly uh, responsible for the guitar being in tune. So you'll notice that nowhere did I mention the tuners. All the tuners do is make it smoother or less smooth to um, operate and, and pull the strings tighter. I'm tucking that one away as well. I'm tucking all of these away because they're all rusty. So, um, yeah. Blimey. Sticky and horrible. Okay. I'll, I'll bring the camera and give you a look at the internals of this thing. I'm going to replace all of these with new. These are all rusty, so you can have new ones. But So, underneath your guitar hood lives... I don't know if we've got enough cable to turn this over. Right, here we go. Under there lives some components. Your three pickups, your neck pickup, middle pickup, bridge pickup. You've got your five-way switch, you've got a volume control, and you've got first tone control and second tone control and there's a capacitor, that green thing there is what makes the tone controls uh, bleed off the trebly sounds and make it sound a bit bassier. So all of this wiring is all about making these three pickups um, capture or register the, um, the movement of your strings and the guitar makes a noise by courtesy of a piece of science. Um, so if I show you, these things on here are magnets, these flat things. And the magnets sit at the bottom of the pickup, and on top of the magnets sit these iron pole pieces. They're touching at the bottom, they're touching the magnets. So that means these are all magnetized. So you can see that, not very accurate, uh, you can see that things stick to them, okay? So they're magnetic. And that's because of the magnets at the back there. So these create a magnetic field um, all the time and the string s sits above it and moves through the magnetic field. And a string that moves through a magnetic field creates um, a very small signal, electrical signal, in a coil of wire that is wrapped around the pole pieces. So when you, when you have the pole pieces putting out a magnetic field and when those pole pieces are wrapped in lots and lots of turns of wire um, moving a string through the uh, this is this is interesting this is a bit off <laughs> moving a string a, a metal string through the magnetic field produced by those uh, pole pieces sorry about the noise that causes a current to build up in the uh, in the copper wires that surround that uh, go around 
thousands and thousands of times wrapped around these pole pieces and you can't see it very well but inside of these inside these little plastic covers there's a, a coil a big coil of wire like a like a ball of wool almost going all the way around these metal pole pieces or these magnetized pole pieces and because of the law of thermo no a law of electronics or whatever that thing's called <laughs> somebody help me um, the, the the act of waving a piece of metal through this little magnetic field on each one above each one of these waving a, a metal string or an iron string with iron in it or ferrous string through this little magnetic field um, causes a current in that coil and it just makes a tiny little current and that current is fed through these controls here to the amplifier which amplifies it and makes it into a loud electronic or makes it into a, a big electronic signal which the amp translates into a loud sound. So that's how the electric guitar makes noise. Now <laughs> some people may not think it's fair to introduce this to Thomas at such a delicate young age but you will hear people talk about something called tone wood. <laughs> I can hear friends of Real Love Guitar saying Sam don't do it you can't do it don't bring up the tone wood subject to a youngster. Well some people think that the wood that the guitar this guitar is made of somehow affects how uh, th this kind of sound that comes out of the amp. Uh, now this isn't going to work. The reason this is not going to work is because it's sheared, not sheared, it's the word, it's, it's seized on. If I can't get this off, we're going to have to do something to get it off. I have to put a new one on anyway. Yeah, so um, some people think that somehow the wood plays a really important part in in the tone or the quality of the sound that comes out of your amp. Now the problem with that argument or that idea is there's no real evidence of any way that can be true. Now why isn't that the right size to do that? That would be helpful. Um, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no real way that can be true. The sound in an electric guitar is, is made or is created by the electrical signals coming out of that coil and going to the amp and if uh, it doesn't really matter if you make a guitar out of glass or wood or plywood as they did a lot of in the 1980s oh, this thing is knackered I'm afraid we're gonna have to lose this it's just not that that's kaput 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 there's no point playing around with that. We just you know, we'll cut our losses. This, if I can't take this apart, then this whole plate may be knackered. Um, we could probably uh, Dremel saw this off and reuse this plate, but it needs a new so uh, new plug. Anyway, yeah. So that there there are there's a kind of popular idea that that tone wood or the kind of wood that your guitar is made of. Um, and changes the kind of sound that the guitar makes. If it's a, an acoustic guitar, one of those hollow acoustic guitars, um, then the wood is all important because the wood makes the sound. It's the, it's the wood of the guitar that resonates and makes the sounds your ears hear. Um, but in the case of the electric guitar, it's not the wood that's resonating to make the sound, it's the strings moving in the magnetic field that makes the sound. Now, of course, you can hear it when it's not plugged in and it has a tone because to some degree the wood is resonating when you um, strum the strings. But there is no way of the guitar, there's no way of these electronic pickups collecting that resonance of the wood of an electric guitar and turning it in the, any useful way into sound because it's like apples and oranges sound is coming through a purely electronic circuit and out through a purely electronic amplifier as you know as I just said 
it, you can hear the strings, but that's, imagine that like a separate train track, right? They're not even connected. It's the sound of the, the wood vibrating and the strings vibrating in normal air, and that's what you can hear. Um, but these pickups can't grab that and turn it into sound. Um, now, some of the older style pickups could slightly do that because they were what was called microphonic, but that's they were microphonic because they were mainly because they were bad as electronic pickups, so they actually work better as microphones. So, they, but they, you would never, even if you had microphonic pickups in here, you could hit the strings all day and um, still not hear. Uh, you know, somehow that, that wood sound wouldn't get through them into the amp because it would be so small in relation to the electronic signal coming from the coil of wire. So I'm chucking all these rusty screws away because now you've got nice screws. I'm not going to chuck these screws away because they're important that they stay, the original ones stay with this bridge. So next stage now will be to um, polish these sand and polish out these frets. Um, after that, I will restring um, and I will cut the slots on the nut so we've got a really nice la uh, first fret action. And then we'll put a new jack socket on, wire that up, and check everything out. This uh, has loose strap buttons, and I'll take these off. And I think these need replacing as well because if the strap buttons aren't firm, then you will risk. Uh, you will risk the um, guitar banging on the floor when you least expect it. I think what I can do, I can give you a special freebie. Um, since I happen to have come across a load of them. So, strap buttons. I'm going to give you some locking, oh god, a locking strap buttons, which um, will really protect your guitar from coming off its hinges and dropping on the floor. So uh, when you come over, or if your parents come over to collect the guitar, I'll show you how these, uh, these fit on. Make sure I've got the right ones. So you get, a part of it goes on your guitar. Um, I'll show you which they are. A part of it goes on your Um, I'm mad that stays on there. Yeah, a bit goes on the guitar body and a bit goes on your strap. And the, the bit that stays on your strap then um, locks into the bit on the guitar body. But what I'm missing for all of these is some screws to do the job. So I'll go and find some of those as well before I go off into... Um, I keep doing this. I don't need to do this. It's force of habit. Always take the nut off. No, you don't need to here. So you don't have to use the locking strap part, but you can do. And it means you can play proper crazy hard guitar without any risk of the guitar falling off the strap. Okay, so how have we got some chunky screws in here? Probably. Let's find a couple of good screws. Here you go. One and two. One and two, slightly different. One and two, different again. The trouble with having such a full container, they all seem to be slightly different. Now I'm getting confused about which bit's which. That goes with that. Stay there. This goes with that, that goes with that, that goes with that. Right, we'll use those. All those can go in there, those go with that, that goes with that. We've got a couple of strapped, uh, strap felts which go under here. So we have this bit and the felt. Now these are going to be bigger than the original ones. So these will go in here nice and firmly like this. And they will, sorry about that, they, they will go in nice and strongly. Let's move this around to here, and now I'm going to push this in. 
Now that is telling me it's spinning, so we're going to have to fill that. It means either we use an enormous screw or we fill this with um, we fill this with some wood. I think we need to do that. That's always happens when guitars get old and well played. They, um, the strap buttons get all mushy and you need to fill them up with some new material. And this is what we'll do now. I'll let this set while we're doing the other stuff. So I'll let the glue set and then once that's done, we can just replace the um, replace the what's it strap buttons. We'll keep those out of the way. So we'll get a bit of glue, hold the guitar that way up. So some glue in there. It could even be, for all I know, this body of this guitar might be plywood. If that's the case, I'm not saying it is, but if it is plywood, then um, plywood is very weak when it comes to holding um, uh, strap buttons and stuff. They, they tend to, uh, screws tend to turn plywood into mush very quickly. So it wouldn't surprise me, but we'll see. So I'm just going to leave that set in its own good time. We'll come back to it a bit later. And we'll do the same at this end for the neck one. Wow, that's a big deep hole. Somebody's definitely shoved a load of screws in there over the time. Um, it may even be that this is too loose, but we'll try. something clunky like that snip it flush thank you wipe, wipe the glue off mostly right down there and get rid of our little glue paper okay so we'll leave those to set and come back when that's done so these are our components. Oh, that's different from that one slightly. Doesn't want to go through quite the same. Now they are slightly different ones. Okay, back to the container. Where's it gone? Uh -huh. Have I put it back in here? Strap buttons. Uh, there they are. <laughs> Thought I'd gone a bit mad for a second. Um, is that the right one? Hello? That looks more like it. So that goes through there. Yep, that goes through there. That goes to there. Pull it up. Lock it in. Yep. Pull it up, pull it out. Right, so there's our new buttons. We will come back to those a bit later on. So that's a little present for nothing extra. Um, we're also going to put new screws in the back of here when it's done. Um, but for now I'm going to go into the uh, sanding and polishing mode for which I will stop the camera and we'll come back afterwards. Um, I think while the camera's uh, off I might also put some sacrificial strings on which is strings I don't care about some I've got plenty of spares I'll use them to set the nut because uh, I also probably oh, I don't have to shout because I'm here I also probably would like to uh, ten and a half I also probably want to um, uh, hmm, carve sand the nut down after I've set the slots right so I'll, I'll use some extra springs I might might do that now, but I'll do it off camera. All right, see you in a bit. Right, now it's time to put some, I've polished the uh, frets by the way. I've, um, I'm gonna put some oil on the fingerboard. Everything's done. I've put a new jack socket on. Um, I had to dremel it off completely because it was completely locked and seized up. 
Um, so anyway, now we're going to put some nines on, stretch them out, and that will be the biz. Just looking at somebody pulling into the uh, industrial estate at this time of the night. Okay, so we have nine gauges. Time to put them on. And once I've put them on, I will then uh, we'll just basically slack or we'll reduce the pressure, the strength on the springs, uh, tremolo springs, and then we'll just get it so it plays downwards at a, a light touch but without too much force. And then we'll put the lid back on, the cover back on. There we are. Now, this next bit of the message will be for Thomas himself. Thomas, it's really important if you want the guitar to stay in tune, right? which I promise you will make a big difference to whether you enjoy playing it or not. Um, when you come to change strings, you have to do what I'm doing. You have to feed them through from the back into this, through this little, these little holes here. So this is the G string and that goes in there, comes out through the saddle and then we pull it tight and we'll get all six strings through there first. So once you, if you want the guitar to stay in tune, um, the bit you have to do from now on, I've done the nut part, but the bit you have to do is you have to be responsible for stretching out your strings once you've changed them and put new ones on. Now, it's a bit of a pain and nobody likes stretching out their strings just for the heck of it because, well, um, it's, uh, it's boring. It's like doing your washing up or tidying your room or something. Okay, so I'll show you what we do. All right. So when you come to attach your strings, you pull the string up and... Hopefully, maybe you get a string winder like this, which is, helps you to do it quicker. So what I do is I line up all the holes in the pegs so they're all facing me, so it makes this job easier. So they're all in a line. And I start with the first one, the thickest one, the low E, and that goes through here. And my, what I recommend you do is pull it all the way through and then hold on to it and pull it back one whole fret. Right, between distance between those two and then start winding and then you hold this one tight as you wind and you make sure this held one goes over the loose one as it comes round. see that it's going over the top of the loose one right there and as the loose one comes round again keep holding this one and you want this time you want this one to go below the loose string so you push it right down there like that in that ditch and as this one comes around, pull it right up and carry on tightening. And then it'll be nice and tight. And this will be where you want it. Where's my clippers? So I'll go through it again. This is the stringing part, right? And after that will come the stretching part. And that's the really important bit to make sure your strings stay in tune. So first of all, you get the string, pull it all the way through until it reaches and then hold on to it the first fret and pull backwards a fret's worth of string. Start winding, hold this one tight, right? hold it tight with your pinched fingers and or, or poke, poke it with this finger like this and then as the string comes round, the loose one comes round, keep this one above the loose one right, as it comes round and then as it comes round a second time push the held one underneath the loose one so you can pull the loose one up so you can see it's right out of the way and then that held one goes underneath this time so and then you cut it off and you keep on doing it that will give you just the right amount of grip for the least amount of string you don't want loads of string too much string coiled around these posts okay hold it see i keep it under tension with my fingers like on a tight rope over the loose string as it comes round. Now this has got the string tree in the way, so put it down underneath the string tree, pull up the loose one and guide the held one underneath the loose one. And as it happens, it's going 
up underneath the string tree as well, which is where it's meant to be. The string tree creates enough angle of the string has to come over the nut at a certain minimal angle. If it doesn't have that angle, it won't play a note as it comes over. It'll, it'll sort of float above the nut, which is no good. So pull it taut, one fret back, start winding. You can see it's, it's caught under the string tree already. So I, for the first go, I lift it out so I can make sure it goes over the loose one. Push it down as the loose one comes around, yank the loose one up and then make sure this goes under the string tree and it will be low, ready for where it will pick up and catch on the string tree, which is where we want. So that string tree, make sure that the angle that the string passes over the nut is big enough angle to make the string play the note properly. So B string, all the way up, pull it back one fret, hold it tight, let it start to grab held string over the loose string, press it right down and let it go under the loose string as the loose string comes around and then drag it back under the string tree and that will let it come up under the string tree. Now sometimes if you end up with this extra bit of string too close to the other one just back it off a bit so you can clip it short without risking cutting into the other string which you really don't want. So these are nine gauge strings um, and they're quite or as light as, you, not as light as you can get, but they're quite light strings. That means they, they're easy to bend, um, they're not too thick. If you go thicker strings, they, they become very difficult to bend notes, which is not bad if you're playing chords, but not so good if you're playing note, uh, melodies and lead, lead guitar pieces. Right, so there's my strings on. Now, the first thing I do with the strings on is let me get a view so you can see. Right, first thing I do every time I put new strings on is I pick the guitar up like this and I sort of give it a pull. Not too hard, but you're sort of bedding the strings in a little bit. Now, if you pull too hard on the thinnest ones, you can break them. So you've got to sort of learn how much to pull them and how not to, how much not to pull them. And I can't tell you straight off, I can't describe it in words, but you'll have to get used to it. Now I'm going to use a tuning fork, but you've probably got, I think you've got a tuner. I think I saw um, your dad with a tuner. So you can use the tuner to tune up. I'm using the tuning fork. Okay, so that's your first tune-up. Then I would suggest you pull it, pull all the strings again. And what will happen is you'll hear the notes detuning. It'll all be out of tune again. Your tuner will tell you that. And once you've done that, tune them all up. And the idea is every time you stretch or pull the strings slightly and it goes out of tune, that's some more slack you've pulled out of the strings. Now it won't go on forever. It won't go on, on forever, but it will go on until there's no more slack to come out. So after you've done a couple of pulls like that, then I want you to stretch the strings between thumb and four fingers like this. So go up and down these thick uh, wound strings and press between thumb and forefinger and you're still trying to get to get out the slack that is kept or held in these strings until they're stretched out. And now a lot of people don't do this and they leave the strings to stretch the slack out over time. And the problem with doing that is that in normal playing you never will play it all out. What will happen is though it will go out of tune every time you play it because there's more than enough slack in those strings 
to keep on going for years. So you've got to get it out at the beginning. Now eventually, you get to a point where it stops doing it, it stops going detuning. So you put it down again and do it again. Stretch, stretch. So eventually you'll, you'll notice that uh, it won't go that much out of tune anymore. And when it reaches that stage, you're pretty much there. And you can play from that point onwards and it will stay nicely in tune. Now, I will get it close and then I will stop. And But you should find that it will mostly stay in tune or pretty much stay very well in tune from the minute you get it. Um, and that's really important when you're starting out playing the guitar because there's nothing worse than struggling to get the guitar in tune. See how little I had to do that? Almost nothing. That's pretty much there. Okay, I'm going to check the playing action of all these strings one more time and then I'm going to set the tremolo. So that's 1.2, very low. The second one is a fraction too low. Too low. Good. Again, fraction too low on the G. That's good. That's a tiny bit too low. Almost there. Check that again. Yeah. Yeah. Right, <laughs> I think we're pretty much spot on there. Lovely and low. That is a light, light, light action on this guitar. Fabulous. Um, right, I'm just going to do a quick double check on the nut settings. If I can find the thing I'm looking for. Things, we're nearly there. Let's just make sure these are the correct height. That's good. rubbing. Same here. <sighs> okay, now I'm going to just uh, reduce the strength of the claw screw at the back here until we can bend the tremolo arm down without with the least amount of um, press. We don't want any, we have to use too much force. So we want it to stay in that place. And I'm gonna replace this thing and hopefully we'll catch the screw thread again. Although it doesn't feel like it's the correct arm, at least 
somewhere along the line it's made, been made to work. Okay, so that's getting there. So I'm just going to take this down. What I want is just enough spring power to keep the uh, bridge plate at the back uh, on the deck. And then give you a little bit of downward movement so that when you come to play it'll work really lightly. Lightly. Now these, unfortunately these arms just don't work brilliantly well but you can see there's a bit too much movement in them and they, they rattle however you do them. Um, I'm going to try and put a bit of shrink wrap on here and see if it will shrink tubing and see if it will help but I'm not 100% convinced it will. Sometimes it makes a little bit of an improvement. Let's put the heat on it and see what we can get. <coughs> plug, 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 plug. Now we've got we've got the bit of the bit of the thread showing. We've got the um, bit of extra material here to sort of stop the arm rattling. I hope and we're going to try and get that to bite its way in. Okay. The downside about this is that <coughs> that's, that's a bit better. We don't want it sticking up so high. Hmm. That's interesting. Why is that doing that? Because that, I have a feeling that's sticking against the plastic a little bit. Not a lot we can do about that. It's just not a perfectly fitted piece of plastic. But, hmm. Yeah. Not ideal. I'm just going to put it a bit further back in. Yeah, it's uh, the, there's a little bit of obstruction by the plastic of the pick guard, unfortunately. What we want is this to come back fully. Yeah, should. Yeah. Tune it. Double check these. 1.5 exactly, 1.4, 1.3-ish, 1.2-ish, 1.2-ish, 1.2-ish. Yes, there we have it. Okay, uh, let's put the cover on the back. We've got these two bits which I'll put on here. Um, if you bring your strap over with you, when you come to get this guitar, I will show you how to put this on. And you'll have a, a, a strap locks that means your guitar will never fall off while you're playing it, which is a pretty good thing to have, actually. 
Right, we got some more fresh uh, thingies. These things, screws. I appear to have lost the thing. Thank you. There we go. So, stretching of the strings is the sing probably the single most important thing in making sure the guitar stays in tune. Um, getting the nut right, as I've done already, is the second or equal most important. And after that, as long as you get those two things, I've done one of them, as long as you do the strings stretching as thoroughly as I just did, every time you change the strings, then it will stay in tune. And you'll have a much better time with it staying in tune. These are only rattling because they will rattle until you put the straps, straps on, but they don't rattle when you've got the straps on. There we go. Lovely, simple Tanglewood Nevada strap. Done on a Saturday night, ready to go to its owner, Thomas. Hope you enjoyed seeing that. Thank you for watching. I'll see you again.